y'all and welcome to the hillbilly chicken ranch i'm susan your hostess and today uh, i was doing a little search on my forum and wanted to find something to talk to y'all about and came across my personal journey into becoming a christian now many of you out there may believe that there is absolutely nothing after you die you just go back to the dust of the earth well the bible talks that we are from the dust of the earth and we shall return to that so that is partially true. However, there is also a place called heaven and a place called hell. And you can't get into heaven without Jesus. There are many, many religions out there. Many, many false man-made gods out there. But there is only one true and living God. And I serve a true and living God. So we're going to get into this a little bit, and I'm going to tell you about a little bit about my journey. Um, but this is basically telling you what it is to become a Christian. Uh, some of you think that when you become a Christian, all your problems magically disappear. That simply is untrue. Becoming a Christian entails understanding that I have sin in my life, and I want to be forgiven. And understanding that I can do... I cannot do anything in and of myself to gain forgiveness. I must rely on the forgiveness that comes through the blood shed by Jesus Christ. Only through God's only Son can I obtain forgiveness. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm going to pull out my Bible. I'm reading out of the King James Version. And the verse that tells me this is John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we have to know who Jesus is. And the Bible from beginning to end is the story of mankind and their failed relationship with God. So as I began to read and understand my Bible, and I was very young when I was saved. Um, I was between the age of six or seven, maybe eight years old. Um, and my pastor was Pastor Dr. Murphy out of Memphis, Tennessee. He preached for many, many years at Highland Heights Baptist Church. And it was a central part of our family to be in attendance at every Time the doors were open to be in attendance and we loved Dr. Murphy. Uh, Dr. Murphy saw me acting out as a child. We couldn't get a seat uh, on the floor so we had to go up into the balcony area and he saw me acting out during a service and signaled to one of the deacons somehow and the deacon came over to my father and asked him to bring me to Dr. Murphy's office after the service was over. Dr. Murphy called me into his office by my name. How he knew me out of all the thousands of people that were in attendance that day, I will never know. But he did and he called me over and I knew I was in trouble, that I had acted bad and lovingly took me on his lap and began to tell me about how Jesus would not like my how I had been acting that day and he says I'm not going to spank you but I want you to know that you have a loving father in heaven that does not want you to act like this in his house and he put me back down and sent me out the door to my dad and we went home and that made such an impression upon me as a child to always try to be on my best behavior whenever out in public and with in the church itself. I did not walk down the aisle when I was saved. I ran down the aisle when I was saved. I had a vision of Jesus. We had two speakers on either side of the church that were way up and I saw a vision of Jesus in that one of the speakers and I went up and told Dr. Murphy I said I see Jesus I see Jesus and I kept pointing up 
and so he began to talk to me and ask me questions about who Jesus was and why I wanted to know him so much and I told him I said I sin and I know I, I sin and I don't want to sin and I want a savior that can save me from my sin so I was baptized at a very young age fast forward about five or so years I think I was around 12 or 13 and we were we had moved from the Highland Heights area out to another little town called Bartlett Tennessee and I was attending a church out there called Fellowship Baptist Church and we had a guest come in we were having we were in revival and we had a guest speaker come in and I went forward to re rededicate my life at that time and when I talked to the pastor and he says because you were so young we want to make sure that you follow through with believers baptism and so I agreed to it my dad agreed for me to, to be baptized a second time which was totally not necessary but baptism is the outward showing of what God is doing inwardly in our life and this is not a normal thing that would happen when you would come forward to rededicate your life this just happened to be the way this pastor handled things so I was rededicated and shortly after that um, I came down with the Asian flu and almost died and I was rushed to the hospital I was having severe convulsions every muscle in my body was convulsing I could not speak uh, and they took me in the emergency room they took me straight back my mother was on one side of me my dad was standing by my head um, both of them were holding trying to help hold me down on the table and I had an out-of-body experience and I saw Jesus and I heard my mother praying out loud and asking God to take her and not take me and I was immediately told by Jesus to return to because it was not yet my time so God saved me from that um, I don't even remember them giving me a shot or anything to try to bring me out of this but I immediately my body collapsed and relaxed immediately when that happened and I went home and I remembered my mother's prayer my mother had water on the brain and shortly after that she did not recognize me uh, and she was accusing me of stealing sewing needles and she, my dad came in and she says Susan has taken all my sewing needles I can't find my sewing needles and so I went over to her sewing machine cabinet and I pulled out the sewing needles I said mother here they are and at that point we realized something was desperately wrong with my mother I called my sister and my dad and my sister got her into what was then John Gaston Hospital they put her on the mental ward which was the very top floor under lock and security uh, because they didn't know what was causing this and we were told that she had water on the brain she needed immediate surgery and it was a 50-50 chance of her even surviving this so she went in for surgery and came out and did not recognize anybody in the family we later found out that this was early onset Alzheimer's with her uh, we still don't know why she had water on her brain but that was something that um, happened almost immediately after she prayed that prayer for God to save me and to take her my mother lived for an additional 10 years uh, not knowing anybody and having to be taken care of why God did that I have no idea but he did it I believe because he was honoring her prayer so that's a little bit of my early understanding of who Christ was and why I became a Christian I saw these things I saw what the power of prayer that my mother gave and 
I knew that I was fully saved and God was going to take care of me and use me in a mighty, mighty way. So, um, the Bible tells us that we are all sinners. And I'm going to turn to Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We cannot save ourselves. We are sinners. We're born into sin from the original Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden sin. Okay, I'm going to skip over to Romans 5 and we're going to read verses 12 and 13. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but the sin is not imputed where there is no law. So, that's basically saying, if you go into a store, and you steal something, you are a sinner. And uh, stealing is wrong. We all know this. We learn this as children, that it's wrong to steal. But there is nothing we can do to save us from our own sin. But there is a free gift that God gives us. And I'm going to read that. It's also in the same chapter, chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more which they receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign by one, Jesus Christ. So this is saying that, you know, your offense, if you go out and you murder somebody and you are put on death row, you're going to pay for your sin. And uh, you can commit many, many crimes and be punished for your sins. But there is one man that has taken on all the sins of the world and his name is Jesus Christ. And so he's taken your sin upon himself so that you can be forgiven of your sin. And I'm going to read uh, Romans 5, 18 through 21. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to con condemnation, that was the act done in the Garden of Eden when they took the forbidden fruit. So we, we received that original sin when we were born. Even so, by the righteous of the one, the free gift came upon all men into justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered into the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reigned through the righteousness of eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. This is saying we are saved by grace and not by any of our own works. And I'm going to turn over to Ephesians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and explain this to you. 
because it's scriptural that we are saved by grace. We're saved by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, by the love of God through the act that Jesus did upon that cross. For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we can't boast about our own salvation. Um, God only had one plan from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. And that plan included his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came into the world as a baby and, a, and lived in a lowly position. He was a carpenter's son. He, he worked as a carpenter. He only had a three-year ministry, y'all. He was 30 years old when he started his ministry, and he died on that cross at the age of 33. But what an amazing life that we have to look at when we look at Jesus Christ. He had no sin, but yet he became sin for us. He became that sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. And y'all, there is no other way for you to be saved than be blood-bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so once I made a decision to follow Jesus and accept his free gift of eternal life, I began the journey of being a Christian. His gift covers all my sins, past, present, and future. I can rest assured I am covered in the blood of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you about that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So my salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. And I can thank God. My, my Savior Jesus for doing what he did on that cross. Let me get over here to my next scripture and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Here it is. So what does all of this mean? Do I still sin? The answer is yes, I'm still a sinner, but my sins have been forgiven. Remember, he covers past, present, and future sins. Romans 3, 7. Give me a moment. I need to flip back. It says, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through, the, through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Wow, why am I still being judged as a sinner? There's a lot of people out there that watch Christians, and they will find fault with every Christian out there. They'll find reasons to believe their own understanding without putting it into context with God's Word. God says I'm saved. I believe I'm saved. It is through a mustard seed faith that I'm saved. A little tiny, tiny seed. And as a child, when I was baptized, my mother bought me a little necklace with a little chain and it had a single mustard seed in there. And she said it was to remind me of the faith it took for me to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So you don't need a lot of faith. You just need a little tiny bit of faith to become a Christian. Will I still suffer with problems? Yes. Why? Because we, uh, we all have to live in this sinful world and the troubles 
that come in many forms. Jesus said we will endure hardships for his sake. In Matthew 10, 22, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. That's not all the scriptures that talk about this, but those are some that I wanted to share today. Um, there is always more as you dig into the Bible and you start to study it for yourself. Anybody that wants to become a Christian can. It takes a little bit of faith and you truly repenting of your sins. So, it is my hope to begin to share my journey of a lifetime as a Christian. For I know what I, what I am and who has saved me from final death. I am a sinner saved by the cross upon which Jesus gave himself as an ultimate sacrifice for me and for you. It wasn't the cross that did it. The Bible says Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to minister to him while he was still on that cross. He went willingly to that cross. He went willingly to save you and me. Jesus gave himself as the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. A death so ugly and cruel, which he willingly gave his own life to save the world of sinners. He not only gave his life, he conquered the grave and is seated at the right hand of the Father. My hope is in him. My life is no longer my own, but a life given completely over to Him. I no longer have to be lonely because not only did Jesus die and resurrect Himself, He gave me a comforter known as the Holy Spirit to dwell within me. This Holy Spirit guides and directs me and even prays for me when I don't know how to pray for myself. I have peace of mind and joy unspeakable, and I am full of His glory. People often, often ask, how do, does one know that they are saved? There is a change that takes place when, within the heart and mind of those who have experienced salvation through Jesus Christ. A change that begins inwardly and expands to every action that we make. We begin to search out the Holy Scriptures, known as the Holy Bible. We want to fellowship with other Christians who are like-minded. We want to tell the world about the, this relationship with the Most High God. We begin a journey in which we follow the footsteps of Jesus. A journey that reflects upon who we are in Christ Jesus, the old self, our flesh, begins to die as we begin the life of service in Jesus' name. No other religion can offer what Jesus offers us. He is the only one who has died for all mankind, resurrected from the dead, and ascended into heaven. His word is truth. He is truth light and life. No other religion gives us the freedom to express what our Lord and Savior can do, is doing, and will continue to do. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that you have enjoyed this little glimpse into how I became a Christian, what led me to that, and my belief is so strong, y'all. I can attest to you that there is a living God. I've seen many, 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 many miracles happen. If you've had a baby you, when you became pregnant and that life grew within your womb, the Bible tells us that he knitted you inside your mother's womb. God isn't everything. There's something called laminin 
you can go look it up, but it is ultimately the gene of God, I do believe. When you see it, you'll want to believe. And if you decide to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's not because of anything that I've told you today. It is because God has already been dealing with you in your heart. And I strongly, strongly want you to know the Lord and Savior as I do. So all you have to do is pray a little simple prayer and ask God to forgive you of your sins and to enter into your heart so that you can grow in his love and ask him to use you for his glory and his kingdom he will do that he gives us the desires of our heart now satan may be whispering in your ear this is a bunch of bunk you don't need to believe that or you may be a Satan worshiper and thinking that he is God and he is not. He is a fallen angel that wanted to be God. The Bible tells us all of this. We know all of the facts. There's nothing new under the sun that we can't learn from God's holy word. It's right here, folks. It's been around for a long time. It's been tested and tried. And it's still here today. Thank you for watching and may the Lord fully bless you.